welcome to our TV show featuring documentaries revealing the realities behind myths using research and scholarship. I'm your host, Ergün Kırlıkovalı, and I will be with you every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're welcome to send me your feedback at hashtag ethocyte. Repeat, hashtag ethocyte. This week marks the 29th anniversary of the massacre at Kocalı, committed by Armenian forces against Azerbaijani civilians during the first Karabakh war of 26 February 1992. Armenian armed groups attacked the Azerbaijani town of Kocalı. In one night, massacred more than 613 civilians, including women, children, and babies. More than 480 were wounded, 1,200 people were taken hostage. Kojala town was completely devastated. Starting in fall of 1991, Armenian forces had started encircling Azerbaijani settlements in Nagorno-Karabakh. During early 1992, the Armenians went on a full offensive, capturing defenseless Azerbaijani villages, expelling their inhabitants at gunpoint. The Armenians, using unprecedented forms of violence and torture, quickly terrorized much of the non-combatant and unarmed Azerbaijani civilian population into flight. Azerbaijani forces suffered losses in an ambush near Shusha on 25th January 1992. Armed to the teeth, the Armenians' next main target was the Azerbaijani town of Kojala, with a population of around 6,000. Kojala, with an airport, railway station, and country roads, served as a transport hub and was considered a hindrance to Armenian territorial conquest. With Armenian forces now in control of Hankendi, to the south and the Askaran area to the north, Kojali was isolated and was placed under siege September 11th, 1991 onwards. The only way in and out of Kojali was via air, when Armenians shut down a helicopter over Shusha in late January 1992, rescue flights virtually ceased. Around 2,500 non-combatant civilians were trapped and at the mercy of bloodthirsty Armenian forces surrounding the city. In the name of full disclosure, there were about 200 lightly armed defenders, including about 20 Oman special police. Ammunition and Few were in short supply, though. The two remaining armored vehicles, for example, were already out of fuel. Outnumbered and outgunned, the Azerbaijani defenders were largely exposed and vulnerable, and the entire town population unprotected. On 26 February 1992, Armenian militias, in coordination with troops from the Soviet 366th Regiment from Hankendi, whose officers were all Armenian, almost all Armenian, 80%, assaulted the town. First ruthlessly pounded by heavy artillery and then brutally crushed about 40 armored vehicles, Kojali's meager defenses were overwhelmed. Now the town had no protection at all. What happened next will live in infamy. The murderous, murderous Armenian gangs and their equally bloodthirsty comrades in arms from the Soviet 366 Regiment committed unspeakable atrocities. The nonstop carnage and the atrocious cruelties the Armenian gangs set in motion claimed the lives of 613 civilians. Unarmed Azerbaijani civilians were put to death in brutal fashion, most after heinous torture. 
War crimes and hate crimes all rolled into one. The massacres committed by the Armenian irregulars, paramilitaries, and the Armenian army were later termed by many the last genocide of the 20th century committed by Armenians. The Armenian writer Zori Balayan, having participated in the atrocities at Kojola, later made the following extraordinary confession. When I and Kachatur entered the house, our soldiers had nailed a 13-year-old Turkish Azerbaijani child to the window. He was making much noise, so Kachatur put his mother's severed breast into his mouth. I skinned his chest and belly. Seven minutes later, the child died. As I used to be a doctor, I was a humanist and didn't consider myself happy for what I had done to a 13-year-old Turkish child. But my soul was proud for taking 1% of vengeance for my nation. Then Kachatur cut the child's body into pieces and threw it to a dog of the same origin as Turks. I did the same to three Turkish Azerbaijani children in the evening. I did my duty as an Armenian patriot. Kachatur had sweated much, but I saw the struggle for revenge and great humanism in his and other soldiers' eyes. The next day, we went to the church to clear our souls from what had been done the previous day. But we were able to clear Kojali of the slops of 30,000 people. Zuri Balayan, Revival of Our Souls, page 260, 261. This speaks a lot about the extremes of Armenian nationalism and the human tragedies they caused in Karabakh. What is perhaps most disturbing about all this is that Armenian authors believe that such inhuman Nazi-like behavior would be in any way justifiable. Justifiable. Armenian nationalism has a strong supremacist dimension and regards Armenians as a superior race and Turks as inferior. That such ideological factors motivated these Armenian war criminals in Kojala is obvious. While such biological supremacy beliefs were popular within the European imperialism before the First World War, they were dishonored after the revelations of the Nazi death camps in 1945. Apparently, such despicable racist ideas still persisted within Armenian nationalism, as the Kojali massacres of 1992 clearly showed. As if that was not enough, in 2003, the Armenian president Sarkisyan admitted that the massacres at Kojali served the effective purpose of the mass intimidation of the Azerbaijani civilians from Karabakh, achieving their complete ethnic cleansing. Dr. Pat Walsh describes Monte Melkonian, a well-known American Armenian terrorist and a leader of the notorious terrorist organization called Asala, as one of the key architects of the many massacres in Karabakh. Melkonian described Kojala as an act of revenge in his diaries that were published posthumously by his brother Marker Melkonian as My Brother's Road, an American's Fateful Journey to Armenia. Melkonian blamed out of control irregular forces for the massacre and the atrocities perpetrated. His brother wrote, Prior to the attack, the Armenian forces had surrounded the town from three sides purposely leaving the fourth open as a funnel for civilians to go through. Residents left in groups determined to trek around 12 kilometers through Armenian-controlled territory to reach safety in Agdam. 
the fleeing civilians were, however, ambushed and killed in brutal fashion in woods and open ground, often with the use of knives. The British Sunday Times of 1st March 1992 announced Armenian soldiers massacre hundreds of fleeing families. The Washington Times of 3rd March 1992 headlined Atrocity Reports Horrify Azerbaijan. The Human Rights Watch Center stated that the actions of Armenian armed forces violated the Geneva Conventions as well as Articles 2, 3, 4, 5, 9, and 17 of the U U UN Human Rights Declaration. The Washington Times correspondent in Agdam, Azerbaijan, Brian Killen, reported this on 3rd March 1992. Dozens of bodies lay scattered around the killing fields of Dagla Karabakh yesterday. Evidence of the worst massacre in four years of fighting over the disputed territory. Azeri officials who returned from the scene to this town about nine miles away brought back three dead children, the backs of their heads blown off. Mr. Farajev said the helicopter bearing Red Cross markings succeeded in picking up only three children before Armenian militants opened fire. When we began to pick up bodies, the Armenians started firing at us, he said. Reuters photographer Frederick Lengyang saw two trucks full of Azeri corpses near Agdam. In the first one, I counted 35, and I looked as though there were almost as many in the second. Some had their heads cut off, and many had been burned. They were all men, and a few had been wearing khaki uniforms, she said. A helicopter pilot who took a cameraman and West correspondents over the area reported seeing some corpses lying around Kojoli and dozen more near the Askeran Gap, a mountain pass only a few miles from Agdam, Washington Times, 3rd March 1992. As a result of Armenian aggression and brutality, an extensive ethnic cleansing of 800,000 Azerbaijani people took place in front of the eyes of the world community. Those refugees spent many freezing winters and scorching summers in their makeshift tents with little food, medicine, or other public services. Armenians' extreme nationalism and inability to conclude a just and lasting peace settlement over nearly three decades led to their resounding military defeat in just 44 days last fall. I can almost hear you asking, where was the United States during all this carnage? Well, the US made some political and diplomatic moves. One of them was to officially recognize the territory, territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, which includes Nagorno-Karabakh region. During the first Karabakh War of 1991 to 1994, over 800,000 Azerbaijani civilians have been ethnically cleansed by the Armenian forces. There were four United Nations Security Council resolutions condemning Armenians' aggression, violence, and ethnic cleansing. Those UN resolutions demanded an end to Armenian occupation of Karabakh and return of the Azeri refugees back to their homes. Armenians arrogantly ignored all of them. Armenia con continued occupation for 27 years 
and refused the right of Azerbaijanis to return to their homes. During this time, Armenia destroyed the Azerbaijanis' homes and even attempted resettling Armenians from Syria into those abandoned Azerbaijani homes in occupied territories. Armenia also tried renaming Azerbaijani settlements, which nowadays constitutes a genocidal intent of cl cleansing the identity of a nation. Azerbaijan restored its integrity after 27 years of failed talks and lack of desire by the international community to apply pressure on Armenia for complying with the UN resolutions. Armenian leadership since 1990s has militarized and impoverished the nation and compromised its independence to Russia for the sake of a utopian dream of greater Armenia. Armenia makes territorial demands to all four of its neighboring nations, all four, not just Arme Azerbaijan, instead of becoming a constructive regional power. Armenia still glorifies Nazi Armenian collaborators such as Garegin Nejde, who participated in the Holocaust on the part of the Nazis, of course. Nejde is also considered a national hero in Armenia today. Imagine that. I would like to share with you these recent articles that highlight the plight of more than 800,000 forcibly displayed Azerbaijanis, a tragedy that has often been overlooked by mainstream media for the last 30 years. Thankfully, the situation is changing. One is from the National Geographic. It's called, I don't even know if my home still exists. You can see the link from here. The other one from the Wall Street Journal, Azeris wrestle over return to abandoned towns decades after the first Nagorno-Karabakh conflict with Armenia. Also, please see the link here. Some pro-Armenian U.S. congresspersons try very hard to torpedo the recently achieved Azerbaijan-Armenia peace. They think they're helping the Armenian lobby in the United States, but they're not. They must now understand, they must now understand that there are new realities on the ground. Azerbaijan and Armenia are working together on unblocking transport links, which will bring the essential, sustainable services for peace, agreeing to exist within their own borders and to respect Azerbaijan's territorial integrity, Armenia will finally have a chance to shake off its international pariah status and become a fully-fledged part of the nation, of the region. I hope that the Azerbaijani-Armenian reconciliation and peaceful coexistence becomes a reality soon. I really do. Did the 44-day war of liberation last fall erase all the pain and suffering of the Azerbaijani people? And what lies ahead? Well, those are discussions for another time. Thank you for joining me. See you next week.